Good morning, everybody. I think you must have heard uh, me talk on researchable issues. Did you all attend that meeting? Researchable issues? Uh, okay. Any of you attended? No. I'm devastated. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm, I'm not really prepared for this uh, talk. Uh, but uh, since I have been requested, I just pulled out some lead to talk today. I have been in Indian Institute of Rice Research from uh, 2006 and since there I have been working on biodiversity in rice and the ecosystem services they offer. So I will keep to my field. Okay. And uh, uh, so I would today be talking on, can you hear me all of you? Okay. Okay. So I'll be talking on the functional diversity and ecosystem services in ephemeral ecosystems. Can you tell me what is ephemeral ecosystem? Somebody? I need answers all, I will not talk. What is an ephemeral ecosystem? Yes, temporary. So in, uh, in a cultivated thing, what is ephemeral and what is uh, permanent or semi-permanent or whatever it is. So a crop, why it is ephemeral? Because in either two months, three months, four months, five months, it's going to be removed. So the crop which is there in the field is supporting biodiversity. So it is an ephemeral system. Whereas if you go to orchards, it's, it's sort of permanent. So the approaches in biodiversity conservation will be different in ephemeral systems. And also it will be different in the permanent systems. Why? Because ephemeral systems offer less scope. They are fast changing. And so the uh, way you conserve things here will be very different. That's why I would like to talk to you on biodiversity conservation and what the ecosystem services this biodiversity offers in the system that is called rice. Rice crop, tell me how many months it will be there in the field? Three months. Okay. But there is a problem in rice crop. Why? Because it is monoculture, point one. Not only this, is it monoculture as a crop, it is also monoculture as a germplasm, right? You have only, though we release so many varieties, in Tamil Nadu, it is like every pongal. In other places, it's like every year some varieties are released. But still, only 2-3 mega varieties rule the country. Can you tell me one mega variety in rice, which you can see from Kanyakumari to Jammu? One variety? Yes. It is sold variously in the uh, um, um, uh, shops as uh, some Sona Masuri, Samba Masuri, Masuri, something like that, right? From Kanyakumari up to Jammu, you will see BPT 5204. Okay, what is BPT? Where is, where exactly? Bapatla. And uh, today what I would like to talk about is germplasm diversity in rice. Faunal biodiversity in rice fields, floral biodiversity in rice fields, what is the functional significance? I will just give a primer on what is the functional significance, then how to harness the ecosystem services from this biodiversity, then what is integrated biodiversity management, then a term called environment quotient, which I hope some future student will take up, not, not much work has been done in India, and uh, then we will conclude this talk. So what is agrobiology? It is the wealth of different plants. Just It is just not the flora. It is the wealth of everything combined in an ecosystem is called as agrobiodiversity. And uh, we had recently a Delhi declaration on conservation of biodiversity also. And uh, if you see in rice, even if you come to the ecosystem where rice is grown, there is a diversity. Rice is grown within Tamil Nadu, you might be knowing within each state, there is a difference. There are places with, where it is grown in submerged conditions. There is a place where in water from the sea enters inside. So rice is grown in various uh, ecosystems within the country, within the state, within a region. And therefore the biodiversity also that it supports will also be differing. And uh, uh, we have if you see in the International Rice Gene Bank, have you heard of this where it is? So in the, in the gene bank, India has 
supplied around 132000 germplasm and this is not even covering whatever we have it is just a part of what what germplasm we have rice the uh, amount of land races the number of land races we have in india is very vast but then you, like you told we have only a few mega varieties that is grown from this end of the country to the other end of the country that is why there is a loss of biodiversity we have within oryza species we have 22 wild rice varieties you see the germplasm biodiversity we have in this crop okay but 90% is cultivated only with a few high yielding varieties coming to the faunal diversity in yeah. rice if you see if you take there are more than 120 uh, species of insects which feed on rice more than 120 and if you take each one there are only five key pests can you tell me what are the five key pests in rice pph yellow stem borer leaf holder galmich no glh because it's a vector as such uh, it is not a major pest but because it is a vector of which which disease vector of which disease yes rice tungro virus it is important otherwise glh is not a very key pest okay so we have five major pests and then ear head bug in some places okay and then you have regional significance pest but if you take each pest under each pest you will have a plethora of natural enemies in the ecosystem see for example yellow stem borer it hosts 85 species of natural enemies and the most vulnerable stage and if you take bph there are 100 species of natural enemies reported similarly in galmich 26 species of natural enemies so this is the trophic ecosystem in rice talking about is the total biodiversity if you see rice is very unique why would it is very unique compared to all the other crops because there are three niches here you have the benthic aquatic and the terrestrial right what is benthic water and mud mixed together where there is less oxygen which is the insect which you see more most commonly in this is in this the chironomids why the chironomids so what is the terminology for chironomids they are called as blood worms they have the adaptation to have heme content so that they can store oxygen so they occur in the benthic uh, situation so it rises very unique in that it has three niches that is the aquatic benthic and the terrestrial and the lower you have plankton phytoplankton zooplankton then there are filter feeders which feed on these then on top of that you have predators which feed on the filter feeders and these are then coming from the aquatic to the terrestrial system right there are a number of papers which say that chironomids actually in direct seeded rice in california it is reported as root midge so sometimes they say that the number increases it is a pest but in general it is considered as a neutral insect but what they say is that if the chironomid pop then the midges when they are the adult the larvae are food for aquatic predators whereas the adults when they come they help to colonize the spiders in the ecosystem so see the link how it happens and we as agriculture managers sometimes what we do we don't think about what we are doing we just throw some herbicide inside we are hitting some trophic level and then the cascade happens so why do you think the outbreaks happen we are we are actually playing with the ecosystem and the trophic levels that is why so even a chironomid which is not considered uh, in any way important in the rice ecosystem has a play a role to play in the ecosystem so that is how biodiversity plays a role then coming to the top you have the terrestrial of course the uh, producers the plants itself and then you have the uh, uh, pest enemies which are the second trophic level then you have the uh, third trophic level which consists of both the predators and parasitoids and the fourth trof trophic level is what yeah hyperparasitoids okay all these consider one ecosystem okay if you see it in a different way so this is how the energy flow happens there is also organic matter and then there are saprophytes in the soil and there are the, they are recycling the nutrients and these saprophytes themselves become food for others and microorganisms are also acting on it and all this form one trophic level that is in the crop 
see this i am trying to give only the aquatic system if you see i was talking about see these we are fed on by some uh, caterpillar uh, uh, grubs grub beetle uh, larvae and then the you have the chironomids uh, the, the the red blood worms all these are the lower level and arthropod eggs then they are fed by the larval predators then they emer emerging uh, midges they become uh, food for the next one and they are carried over to the terrestrial which is what i was talking about so this is how a trophic system a whole eco agro ecosystem if you are studying biodiversity this is how you should approach it you cannot think of just a single thing it is a whole so you know arthashastra says the enemy of thy enemy is your friend that is what biological control is okay and biological control you know is of three types one is conservation second is augmentation and third is inundation okay so augmentation or inundation in rice what is the general biological control agent which you see in rice which is used for applied biological control i am not hearing louder what is the bio control agent which is released in rice ecosystem for biological control there is trichogramma from ages we have been using only trichogramma there are two species which are used chilonis and japanicum and there is no other organism that is used for applied biological control that is by inundation what is inundation you are flooding the field so that it will give as much as chemical control that is what you are doing that is you are saturating the field with the organisms 1 lakh per release that is what we do right 1 lakh six releases that is how inundation is done augmentation we don't have anything in augmentation is just releasing a little uh, parasitoid and then we making it establish you know augmentation plus classical biological control recent example somebody can give me a very successful one which has been done in india anagyrus lopezi so that is a very successful one there you are augmenting and also not augmenting you are just inoculatively releasing and then it has established okay augmenting is something where already it is there but a little bit you are adding to it so now what i wanted to talk about is conservation in rice ecosystem applied biological control you have only one but you know that you have a plethora of natural enemies and trichogramma is not if you take the stemborer egg mass maximum of only 16% of the eggs will be parasitized by trichogramma after trichogramma you will get telinomas then you will get tetrastrichus tetrastrichus actually causes up to 100% parasitization but is not rareable telinomas also you don't rare only you are depending on trichogramma and that 16% parasitization only you expect therefore the way to go in rice ecosystem is conservation biological control okay and if you come to the gild composition that is biodiversity analysis in rice this is how the predators parasitoids more predators are seen parasitoids less then you have phytophex neutrals okay then uh, among if you see, go closer only 5 species of uh, parasitoids and 30 species of uh, predators are more in number in the field that means there are a number of parasitoids but key only this many are there and even among the parasitoids that are recorded the most important one in rice ecosystem which you see is cepidon species which is a mollusk parasitoid if you do any sweep net sampling you will get more of cepidon actually it is a dipteran fly so it is a mollusk parasitoid therefore actually what you see in the field is only very less you see this is the predator biodiversity every group you can see in the rice field these are all recorded from my field you get spiders you have uh, the uh, asopine group of uh, pentatomids uh, soldier uh, bugs you those two are soldier bugs then you have the nabidae then you have even uh, crickets Uh, predatory crickets then you have coleoptera odonata even diptera you know have you seen this diptera and uh, predator any time it's a very good predator of midges gall midges there's a paper on it actually and then biodiversity of parasitoids again it is very vast within one group if you see coccinellids alone you take there are around 13 species recorded across india in rice ecosystems but if you go within this group of coccinellid and check whether they are really important in the rice field for example microspis discolor is the most predominant coccinellid have you all 
color in the field so my crisp is discolor my friend uh, the uh, dr purni who is the expert says we should use microsp microsp is discolor complex because there is a number of uh, sub groups in that so if you see the functional significance this microsp is discolor occurs mostly on the panicles you will find more in the flowering stage why because it has also been recorded earlier in zedkan's book also that it is phytophagous also it feeds on it's a pollen feeder mostly so if you check the you will think that there is see when we are doing studies on tox toxicology you do the safety to natural enemies and you will be counting the number of uh, uh, coccinellids microspis discolor comes the most actually but this mostly is a pollen feeder and it is a stick predator so that is a it is very important to study the functional significance of biodiversity too and the other predator which is very important in the rice ecosystem is the mirig again in situ rearing is the only way forward which has been many people have attempted it even on corsera eggs they have tried but it's a facultative uh, uh, host but they have not been successful and we have not been able to successfully rear and release in the field though there is a japanese paper where they have released in the field and they have studied that it is very effective but Petronas lividipennis is a very density dependent, dependent predator. If you have more BPH population, you will have more numbers. If you have less, very less. That means the matching of control will not be there. That predator to uh, prey ratio, where you get biological control, is not there. If you take for the Petronas uh, lividipennis, if you take Elo stemborer, similarly, what I was talking earlier, the main problem why we are not which i hope the future uh, students will take up is because we don't have host rearing host rearing sirpophaga nowhere in the world we have mass production technology sirpophaga occurs in two crops can you tell me which are the crop you see sirpophaga in certulus is rice sugar cane also you have both sirpophagas we don't see in sirpo in uh, rice you have two three species of sirpophaga actually you have white stem borer also and you do not have rearing technology for this because we do not have rearing technology for this we are not able to mass multiply the very important parasite that is the tetrastachys shinobi but as uh, my approach would be that you students should be able to take up this because you have more energy you have more patience and you have more time on you that you should take up mass production technology for these kind of hosts so that you will be able to rear these kind of reticent parasitoids which can be released in the field and that can cause about 90 to 100% of control then coming to the conservation biological control so far we saw that applied biological control is not very effective except trichogramma that causes only 16% of the egg uh, parasitization in stem borer egg masses so coming to what is ecological basis for habitat management how you go about conservation biological control is you do habitat management it is a very simple technology where you modify the habitat so that you are able to conserve whatever is there and en enhance their activity so that is habitat management and if you see what uh, the basis is it not only enhances parasitization or uh, good uh, uh, insects it also enhances the nutrient cycling it makes the microclimate fa favorable uh, for reducing pest and increasing the natural enemies then it gives a uh, biodiversity of crops in the field and uh, how how do i say it is biodiversity of crop what is it i am trying to tell how do you increase the biodiversity of crops in the field think you have rice crop how or you have cotton crop how do you increase the biodiversity of crop in that field you have intercrops you have border crops so that is how you are going to increase the uh, crop biodiversity in the field okay then it also increases the beneficial biological interaction like i was telling you so what works in habitat management is called the top down approach or natural enemy hypothesis what we are doing there is push it is generally comes under the push pull strategy what is push pull strategy and where it has been very famous yes africa it has been used for stem borer management where what they are doing is they are using a different crop which will repel the pest so that is called the bottom up approach 
means you are at a, you are trying to use a producer which is repelling the next trophic level so that is called the bottom up approach top down approach is a conservation biological control where you are trying to manage the natural enemies okay natural enemy of hypothesis or top down approach so what we are trying to do here is we are trying to increase the floral diversity what we get from it is called snap that is shelter nectar alternative prey host or pollen okay this is what you are getting from the habitat management that is increasing the floral diversity in the field so what in rice field has worked for us with habitat management is you see these are all very simple techniques it is like going to the allopathic doc doctor or taking an ayurvedic medicine okay because there may not be a quick knockdown like chemical control but it will keep the system very healthy and it will keep your pest level lower so here what we are doing telling us apply some organic manure in the field why we are telling us i was talking about earlier about the trophic systems when you do organic manure there is some amount of saprophytes these saprophytes will feed the aquatic predators the aquatic then again the uh, adults of these saprophytes are going to be helping in the colonization of early predators in the terrestrial system so some amount of organic manure application we are recommending and then the second one is seed treatment with bio agents we have number of bio agents called as pgprs now so they not only help uh, in so one way is going to host plant resistance in it in it, this is called as induced resistance where you are trying to incorporate that is you making the plant immune to pests and diseases you are making the plant uh, not attractive to the pest population so that is how seed treatment of in rice we have tried uh, three organisms that is trichoderma and then we have pseudomonas and also we have a bacillus subtilis uh, cabrialsi strain which is which we have found very successful then alleyways this is a very simple technology which has already been adopted by a number of farmers in andhra pradesh and telangana and also in other places why because first they used to complain we have to we will be losing two lines this is nothing but skip pro every two rows every 10 rows you miss two three rows so the farmers used to complain that no we are going to lose yield but then they realize that the pest population is managed therefore therefore their inputs is reduced and thereby the yield is increased that is why now even without us telling now alleyways are being taken up by the farmers alleyways what they do is they help in movement of parasitoids and predators and also in reducing the pest population because microhabitat management is there then judicious use of safe and i wouldn't say there is any safe insecticide but relatively safe insecticides you please use and please don't use it in the early part when colonization of predators and parasitoids is occurring so 45 days what we uh, what we recommend is you apply a granular insecticide in the nursery before pulling the plants 7 days before pulling the plants so it is systemic so the plant takes the uh, insecticide and so it is protected and when you transplant not only you are reducing the amount of insecticide which is used but it will also reduce the amount uh, the it will also give the plant immunity to pests for at least 30 to 40 days in the field so this is what we recommend uh, by judicious use of safe insecticides okay we are by these methods we have found that we can reduce two to three sprays in the farmers field which is really great as an agriculture uh, you know um, scientist we should be able to tell how the farmer can reduce inputs not just see if you all go to the field you all must have experience the farmer just wants a recommendation in insecticides for the pests but we should also be able to say how we can reduce the insecticide and what problems they are coming we are facing because they are using insecticides okay. then monitoring mass trapping through pheromone traps you know there is pheromone for only one right now which in rice ecosystem hello stembora leaf holder it is in the pipeline but we have only for allo stemborer you can use 12 uh, traps per uh, uh, acre where you will be able to mass trap the uh, insects or you can use it for monitoring then floral diversity which i was talking about and conserving natural enemies so first when we started habitat management we were trying to use flowering weeds in the field when we were trying to study whether they are useful for conserving the natural enemies and we found that a number of weeds especially belonging to uh the composite family they are able to host a number of uh, predators and parasitoids but 
when we can't go and give this recommendation to the farmers actually even when uh, when we talk in uh, scientific forums it will not be accepted because how can we just conserve weeds in the field so that the early part though we know that we have done a number of studies we know that flora surrounding the field many of the coccinellids established themselves in the surrounding flora and only then move into the rice fields so then we went on to introducing crops so all these crops we have tested around 9 to 10 crops in the farmers field like marigold any type of pulses then coriander any umbelliferae crop they are very good in attracting and but more in the winter season that is the rabi crop and then you have uh, sanam you have bindi all these crops can be grown this is actually a farmers field view in uh, nalgonda in nalgonda in uh, in telangana the rice growing region is in the nalgonda district and this district actually in this place actually there are two festivals which come during the karif season one is the dashara and another is the diwali both they use marigold uh, in a big way and uh, the cost goes from 20 rupees kg to 120 rupees kg so we what we wanted to do was not only give monetary returns to the farmers we are also trying to conserve the natural enemies so we introduced this crop in the field and the farmer was very happy with this actually if you see some of the we were thinking earlier that uh, selecting crop is very important so first we were trying only the short duration short stature crop on the rice buns because we are growing these crops on the rice buns but when we saw in some of the regions in the farmers field they are also growing uh, creepers with these kind of nets the uh, farmer has this practice actually habitat management is just a practice which we are trying bringing in which was used by the farmers earlier the farmer used to try to use his land very effectively and there used to be a crop diversification in the field but they have lost it now that is why we are trying to introduce this now and not only do, does this uh, increase the natural enemies uh nutrient cycling you see look at the weeds otherwise because there this question i used to get in number of forums how can the farmer walk on the bund if you are going to put a crop but if the bund they do not have a bund crop this is how the farmer's field looks it has full pathinium so it is not that the bund is just empty and the farmer can walk through it it is either the weed or it is the crop we can also integrate beekeeping with uh this this is from vietnam actually we are also trying to introduce this so this is actually we can introduce the uh, beekeeping also along with the floral diversity in rice fields so that the farmer can get something not only does floral diversity faunal diversity increase we can uh, we also see that rice as such in rice fields uh, can be considered as wetland biodiversity you know there are number of migratory birds coming from outside and they like ibises and then a number of uh, sandpipers they you can see in plenty so you can see predatory birds and of course gray and granivorous birds are also there which have to be managed but how to increase predatory birds by bird perches they increase the biodiversity and also manage your rodents so these are small techniques which can be incorporated in habitat management that will enhance the uh, pest management and reduce the insecticide use there also the rice flora surrounding and also including rice they support number of pollinators now it has become mandatory we study pollinators in agro ecosystems and also how much uh, because a lot of uh, uh, talk is about we are losing bees we are losing uh, the pollinator species therefore we will lose fruits you must have read papers about it so this is one way that rice paddies also support the pollinator species a number of pollinators have been recorded in uh, rice ecosystems and uh, some of the uh, floral diversity there are around uh, 29 families uh, uh, plant species belonging to 29 families occur on the rice buns many of them have medicinal value and some of them act as candidate plants for habitat management you can selectively leave them on the buns uh, when you are cleaning so that they will be able to support the natural enemies and this is the integrated biodiversity management from habitat management point of view every single uh, intervention in integrated pest management you can incorporate some of the methodologies like if you see cultural interventions you can use refugia banker plants and then varietal interventions you have to concentrate on varieties that are more suitable for uh, natural enemies and then you have mechanical interventions in northeast some uh, they already use what they do is they use bamboo 
holes and they collect all the egg masses of stem borers and they put it inside and they close it and leave holes only for the parasitoid to emerge. In that way, what they are doing is they are uh, removing the pest, but they are allowing the parasitoid to move and parasitize further. So that kind of uh, mass emergence devices can be used, bird perches can be used, then chiromones, food sprays, then chemical intervention. Of course, I was talking about no spray period and bio biodiversity management. So these are the total ecological benefits of habitat management. If you increase floral biodiversity, you enhance parasitoid fitness. We have done a lot of studies on how the floral, if you give uh, the nectar from these floral diversity uh, crops, the longevity of the parasitoids is increased. And then you have increased soil fertility and total higher, higher beneficial insect biodiversity. Another topic which is coming up is the herbivore induced plant volatile and it's used in chemical ecology. I have earlier also talked about this and this is very attracting the tritrophic uh, uh, natural enemies and this can also be used in habitat management. So we have three pronged uh, benefits from growing bunt crops. One is ecological, biodiversity is increased, nutritional, it provides low cost protein and also uh, vegetable sources and monetary returns is the third one okay then uh, I, I the last one i would like to notice there's very less work done on environmental quotient in agroecosystems in india actually what is environmental quotient what we are trying to say generally what we do to assess whether a technology is good what is the methodology we use we use benefit cost ratio right benefit cost ratio only uses the input cost and the output uh, whatever you are getting. So that is how you calculate. There are so many other benefits which are there in a particular technology, especially such as conservation biological control. So in, if you use an environmental impact quotient which in, in, uh, integrates all this, how much of nutrient uh, cycling has happened, how much of biodiversity has been and if you can create an environmental quotient and we can say okay this is what is it is giving to the environment it is it is giving to the human health if you are able to get a quotient it will be very good when we are talking about uh, technology especially uh, this kind of ecological technologies uh, which is sustainable and environmentally which are good that is uh, that is what i would like you students to take up because a lot of not some work has been done in other countries, but there is no work in India about environmental quotient and I would really advise that students take up this kind of studies. So what is the lacunae in these kind of biodiversity and conservation studies? First is insect taxonomy. Very less work has been done. We really don't know even now. For example, I would give you two examples. There are mimorid parasitoids and, uh, and egg parasitoids of hoppers. So far we have not confirmed or by morphological thing what is exactly the species in different regions example anagras some quote it as anagras uh, nila parvate some quote it as something else oligocita nias oligocita species so these kind of studies have never been taken up so taxonomy is the biggest lacunae when it comes to biodiversity management and uh, there is a recent study which says that overall taxonomy in europe of course they are saying the taxonomic capacity is threatened or eroded 34 to 30 to 40 percent so in India, I'm sure it is definitely greater than that, actually. Then second is functional significance or analysis of predators and parasitoids. Many studies have been done elsewhere, but here we have not done gut analysis of really whether a predator or parasitoid, predator, parasitoid, of course, you will know the ecology, whether the predator is feeding on the pest. So gut analysis of the DNA of prey in uh, will give a good uh, thing of what really it is feeding in the uh, rice field. What is the reality of the predation? And uh, elimination depletion microplot studies. We constantly say biodiversity helps, we release, we inundate and we say yes, pest, pest is managed. We have not directly studied whether we remove the spiders and we really having some impact. That kind of depletion studies have not been taken up. That would be really good. And then third one is environmental question which I was talking about earlier could be modeled on key insect species at least to indicate health of the system and the relationship with the pet, pest insects. 
so way forward is you know government is also uh, talking about organic farming and uh, therefore in situ conservation floral biodiversity and faunal biodiversity can help in this and another thing which this government has come up with doubling the farmers income one way is to increase the yield second is to decrease the input so this is also one way of doubling the farmers income and you're giving a monetary return so that is one of the ways then uh, as i was talking about is avian biodiversity it is uh, and then odonate biodiversity i would really like to say this you know rice fields is where most of the odonate biodiversity occurs and in odonata if you see there is around 27 species which are told as endangered or near threatened so you can see rice paddies are conserving uh, these uh, odonate uh, species so that that would also be a good thing to approach it from that point of view and uh, uh, further in, then conservation in c2 whatever free services can save millions this is all blah 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 okay that i would like to say thank you and if you have any questions i'd be ready to take